The CW Twin Cities presents See What's Now, your entertainment news source. Hey everybody, John Foss, CW Twin Cities, and I'm very excited to be talking with Andrew Zimmern. Thanks for talking to us. Oh no, my pleasure. So what brings you out here tonight? Uh, food fan, film fan, Twin Cities Film Fest fan. Um, I just think it's really important, to, you know, that we're showing and exposing people to great stories. I mean, that's how I think the best way to learn. I call it adventure learning, right? It's not necessarily in a classroom. It's, you know, through observation and participation in life. We are now at a point where documentary filmmaking finally has a distribution mechanism built into it that, yes, still needs some improvement, but is much different than it was, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, you know, premium channels are now buying them up, you know, YouTube, social media, there's so many ways to expose people to really great ideas. And I think that through food, which I believe is the ultimate shareable, teachable, transpository cultural totem, if we have a documentary about food, or even the one that's food adjacent, uh, we can we can really make it sticky for people. You know, we've raised a, a generation and a half of food lovers, unlike anything we've ever seen. We're in the most romantic era that we've ever had culturally with food in in any culture in the history of the world. And I think this is the perfect intersection of uh, you know film with audience with distribution platforms. So hopefully this is going to raise a lot of questions and promote a lot of conversation. And you're out here to see the film Chef Flynn. Yeah. First of all, what do you know about the film and what do you know about, about Flynn? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I know a lot about him and I you know, I, I know enough about the film. I would have seen it regardless of being invited here uh, to participate in a QA and a uh, afterwards to discuss food and movies and this particular film as well. You know, young kids, here's the the perfect example, you know, uh, a food obsessed 10 year old who's now oh, not technically much older than that, right? Um, just opened his first restaurant in New York City. Have you eaten there yet? But had, had a chance, I have not. Okay. Uh, you know, that a young kid, you know, just like me, I, I didn't open up a supper club in my parents' home when I was growing up, but I loved cooking when I was little and I knew the die was already cast. My parents knew when I was seven or eight, I'd be in the food business. So to see a young, young person who so clearly has a dream and then pursues it from, you know, pop up in his own house to working with some of the best chefs in the world and really crafts technique and style and yes, Brash idea, yeah. Uh, big ego, we all have them. Uh, but I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful story, and I think it's going to create a lot of questions that uh, people are going to want to, you know, explore. And I think all good documentaries are thought-provoking and encourage people to continue the conversation afterwards. You know, more so than, did you really believe that that giant airplane would fall on that guy and not kill him? Which is the question in in most popular movies that we all struggle to answer. Do you see a lot of Flynn in yourself? Uh, I or see a little. Versa? I see a little bit of of him and me, and me and myself. In that, one thing that we have in common is knowing from a very early age that we were destined to do this. I knew I was going to be in the film. Well, my parents maintained that they knew I was going to be in the food business when I was five years old and uh, you know I remember being six seven years old and knowing that I just I wanted to be involved in food and that was during the 60s a time where going into the food business was not something that every parent wanted to hear or that was really either a, a viable route uh, to you know you know foundational happiness I saw what was going on in restaurants even as a young kid and was so attracted at the the, the plates going by and the buzz, the nightly theater of it, I was hooked at a very early age and loved food. So for, for me, it was set in stone. I recently heard that Bizarre Foods, you actually created it a long time before it was on the air. How yeah. did you create it? What in your head? I mean, you weren't in TV at the time. How did you create the, the show? Uh, I was... I <laughs> I'm a I'm a keen cultural observer and always have been and I saw a world in which we were becoming defining ourselves more and more by the things that separated us rather than the things that united us and that's even more so today we're in a very divided country many many different ways and cultural culture wars really dominate our landscape you know I thought anything that we could create that could unite people around a cultural totem, and I think food is much more powerful than math or music. No one ever 
you know, punched you in your face because you stole their quadratic equation. If you take somebody's boom box, you know, uh, there's a problem. But if you take away rice or bread, there's blood in the streets. Historically, that's the stuff that, you know, revolutions are made of. Um, so when it came to Bizarre Foods, I wanted to, to sell a show about patience, tolerance, and understanding in a world that was running short of it. Now, the problem with that is that's not really a good sell in the room. So I had to put some boundaries around it that were a little sticky for people, like, you know, fat white guy goes around world and eats bugs. So, you know, you overlay those two a little bit, and then gradually over the years I was able to, to pull away the bug eating and let people see the cultural storytelling that was involved around the food. Will you say no to eating anything? No. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say that. If you gave me a bowl of hot oatmeal with a spoonful of brown sugar and some raisins on top, I'd... No, no way. No. That seems pretty tame compared to what you've eaten. No, no, it's not tame. It's okay. it's horrifically textured. It's not good. It's also not the best way to utilize oats, which are a magical ingredient. I love them in lots of other dishes. For the life of me, I can't understand why this ancient food has stuck around and why people continue to eat this gloppy mess. It's a head scratcher for me. I'd much rather eat a raw iguana, All right. which is delicious, by the way. I'll have to try it. Yeah. Well, Andrew Zimmern, thank you so much. Enjoy you. Chef Lynn tonight. Yeah, it was an honor to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.